Welcome everyone. Good morning on this beautiful spring day outside. I wasn't sure what it was going to do when I first got up. It looked like it was going to be cloudy today, but now it's burned off and it's just a beautiful day out. I hope you're all well as you're staying at home. I read an article uh, recommended by Greg Yee, our superintendent, and the article suggested that this may go a lot longer than we think, especially uh, getting back together as groups. It was an article about events, uh, large events, but it applies to churches as well. And so we may have to continue to meet together over video and Facebook and YouTube and over Zoom. Nancy had her Zoom Bible study yesterday, and it was really fun. I think nine of the women got together in our church for that Bible study. Just really glad you're here uh, joining us today. And I hope um, this will be an enriching uh, morning for you. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I just uh, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the beauty of creation all around us. I thank you for the beauty of your presence always with us. I thank you that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that we have all received grace upon grace, grace after grace, just like ocean waves. Your grace continually fills our life. And we have all received it, Lord, not just those of us who believe, but every person on the planet. As we live, we receive your grace. You hold us together. You love the whole world, Lord. And I pray for everyone gathered today that we would know your love today. That we would know your sweet spirit. That we would know your kind and gentle presence, Lord. So once again, I just pray that you would fill us with an ocean of your Holy Spirit. An extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit today and throughout this week. I pray that you would let the fruit of the Spirit mature in our lives, that the gifts of the Spirit would be manifest in our lives, that we would worship in spirit and in truth, that we would learn to share our faith by the leading of the Spirit, and that we would be listening to your words, which are spirit and they are life. Thank you that you have loved us. Thank you for your grace. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we have another video call to worship followed by a couple songs. I hope uh, you're able to sing along as a family.
when darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow tries to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know. Oh, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died by richest gain I count but long and poor content on all my Welcome again to our home, to our living room. My mom is with us here and my wife and my daughter, Nicole. So I'm very glad to have you here. I saw that Susan was here. Hi, Susan, and anyone with you, welcome. We're really glad all of you are here. I know our friends from Nevada are, are watching their own church today, but they're gonna watch this later on YouTube. So you can always catch these services and also our reading of the Psalms and our noon, noontime prayers on YouTube. There's a link to it on our Facebook page, and so you can go there and watch them at, at your convenience and at your leisure. I'm really enjoying doing the Psalms and doing this broadcast. I think when we get back to the building, whenever that may be, we will continue to live stream our services. I'm really excited about this because we can 
um, get the word out to more and more people. And that's, that's our motto as a church is to get the word out. So let's begin with uh, or continue with prayer again. Kind and merciful Father, I just uh, thank you for this day. Again, I thank you for your wonderful presence with us, for that abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, that abiding friendship of the Holy Spirit, which is closer than our skin, for the boundless, immeasurable, infathomable, unfathomable love of Christ, which is greater than any ocean. And I thank you for your grace, God, that you have graced us immeasurably. Father, as I think about this world we're living in right now, it's such a strange place to be in. I imagine this is what people felt like during the Depression or during the Spanish flu epidemic. It's not nearly as bad. But there's been a tremendous loss of life and a tremendous threat to loss of life, Lord. And sometimes we ask, why, Lord? Why are you allowing this to happen? Other than it's the consequences of our own doing. And yet I know that you are the potter and we are the clay and you are fashioning us. You are shaping us into something marvelous, the very image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't see it now so very well, but one day when we see you, we will be like you. So I pray that everyone who has gathered today watching and everyone who will be watching and listening later, that you would continue to be the good potter in our life, that you would shape our lives, that you would mold us. We want to be molded into something that is spectacular in ourselves. But what you mold us into is simple earthen vessels to hold the broken body of Christ, to hold his shed blood, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that gospel that offers forgiveness and life and transfor transformation, Lord. Father, I'm reminded again of the disciples when they were in the boat and you had gone to pray. Actually, it's, a, it's the other time when you were in the bow of the boat, sound asleep, or the stern of the boat, sound asleep. And a mighty storm, a great storm came upon those disciples and they were afraid that they were going to get swamped and not make it. And they woke our Lord Jesus Christ up and cried out to him. And he simply said, peace, be still. The same one who spoke creation into being, who knit us together while we were yet in our mother's womb. And Jesus spoke, peace, be still. And immediately the storm died down. And immediately a great calm, a great calm came over the waters, over the Sea of Galilee. Father, I don't know if you've sent this great storm into our life. But whatever the case, we pray with one voice today that you would say, peace be still to the storm. Peace be still, that you might bring this pandemic quickly to an end. That's our request, Lord, but as I prayed before, more than that, we want the potter to be shaping our lives. We want the potter to be shaping the world's lives, drawing people to you, turning their hearts towards home. We have eternity in our hearts, Lord. And so we pray Jesus' garden prayer not as we will, 
but as you will, Lord. Not as we will, but as you will, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 27, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. or the, No, actually the New International Version. Sometimes I like to mix it up. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war breaks out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above, above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Your face, Lord, I will seek. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today and the hearing of it as well. So before I begin our message, uh, let me pray one more time. Father, once again, I come before you just an earthen vessel and sometimes a cracked pot. And once again, I pray that you would fill me with an extraordinary measure of your spirit today. I can't do this without you, Lord. So once again, I, I pray that you would come and speak through me, that you would give me words, that you would give me clarity, that you would help me to stay on track and on task, Lord. And these few short verses we're going to be looking at this morning would give untold hope into the lives of everyone who's listening now and those who, and watching and those who will be watching later. I pray that you would bring me to say everything I need to and keep me from getting off trap, tr track or going on tangents. Keep me from saying the things I don't need to, do, Lord. Help me to enunciate clearly. And Father, for everyone listening I, and watching, Lord, I pray that you would give us open hearts and lives to receive the word that you have for us, that you would fill us with a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue our study of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And that's the entire text right there. And you can wonder, how can he preach on such a short text? Well, I'll give it my best. It's a passage that's wonderfully put together. Paul wrote it, but the Holy Spirit inspired him to write it. And so Paul was a human quill, if you will, for the Holy Spirit writing it. He used Paul, his personality, and yet the Holy Spirit penned these words. So let's read. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Let's unpack this. Right off the bat, we see the word therefore. And anytime you see the word therefore, it's a, it's a word that conveys a transition uh, in an argument or in a piece of writing or in oral culture. It, it meant in light of what we have just seen, now, because of that, we can say what's following. And so I always like to look back and catch what was the therefore, therefore, as we've said many times. 
So we look back at last week's text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And it says, we, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our, is our house, is torn down, speaking of our mortal bodies, we have a building from God, meaning a permanent structure, a body that's indestructible, a house not made with hands, spoken into being by the word of God, by Jesus himself, eternal in the heavens. So right now we have this temporal body. We're having this incredible body prepared for us. Even now as we speak, Jesus is preparing for us a resurrection body that will never die, that will never uh, have pain, no more tears, no more grief. It's eternal in the heavens. And because it's eternal in the heavens, it's protected there by God. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with, clothed with our dwelling from heaven. I know this full well. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. None of us want to die. None of us want to experience death. We want to have Jesus come back now and, and translate us immediately to heaven with no death. Wouldn't that be wonderful? For indeed, while we, were in, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. For Paul, he had gone through all that torture, presenting the gospel. Five times he received the 39 lashes. One time he was stoned, left for dead. Another time he was beaten with rods. Actually, three times he was beaten with rods and so on. He knew what it was to groan, and some of us know what it is to groan. With the aches of pain, pains in life, not just the physical ones, but the emotional and psychological and the, the social uh, maladies that we experience, shattering relationships and that kind of thing. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. We don't want to just die, but we want to be clothed with those immortal bodies so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life, by eternal life, by a life that never ends, and literally by the eternal life that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose, he's the one doing the preparation, not us, is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. So as we saw last week, the moment you believe, the Holy Spirit breathes into you a new spirit, breathes into you his presence, and we are born of the Spirit. We are gained the gift of eternal life the moment we believe. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. It goes on and it says, always, the word always there. I think I can read all right over that word without really focusing on it, but always means at all times, ever. So being at all times of good courage, being ever at good courage, this is difficult. I'm not always at good courage. I'm not ever at good courage. Sometimes I get depressed. Sometimes I get very down, especially with my circumstances. Sometimes we all get down in the harsh circumstances of our life. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation. You shall have that wine press of trouble in your life. But do not fear, for I have overcome the world. He is the victor. He has overcome. But notice that it doesn't, it doesn't promise us that we'll never have trouble, that we'll never have difficulty. In fact, the opposite isn't true in the Christian life. We are afflicted in every, every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. But in the midst of this, Paul says he always takes good courage. At all times, he's taking good courage. And it's because of the knowledge that he had. It's because of what he had seen. I look back over the, my life, and when I remember what God has done for me in my life, then I take good courage for what lies ahead. So always of good courage. Good courage means to be of good cheer. Have courage. Be full of hope and confidence. It's sometimes hard to be full of hope and confidence in the middle of this pandemic. As I said at the beginning, I, I read that article recommended to us by our superintendent, Greg Yee. It's out of the event industry the large event industry, meaning like concerts and the sports events and so on, they're predicting that we won't be getting back to those events until maybe November, which would include churches because we can't control who comes, 
who might be sick with COVID-19 and we start the whole thing all over again. And so we're going to have to be really patient. And in the midst of this, can we be full of hope and confidence that God is using this in our lives to transform us from one degree of glory into another? He's the potter, we are the clay. So even this, he's using to shape our lives. He's using it to grow our faith, to grow our trust in him. Therefore, always of good courage, all the time, we look to the Lord. And when we look to the Lord and we remember what he's done in our past, we take good courage. We're always of good courage. And then it says, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. This word knowing is also a very specific word. It's not the normal word for knowing. It, it's a perfect tense verb, which means the knowing is complete. Paul is certain of what he knows. He's already seen it. He's understood it. It means to have seen or perceived, hence to know. So he's already seen something. He's already perceived something. And thereby, he, he, he knows that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. And I'm, I was wondering to myself, well, what, what has he seen? What has he perceived that would give him this confidence that when he dies, he's going to go right to be with, with God, with the Lord in heaven, with Jesus? What had Paul seen or perceived that led him to know? Well, I think of the story of his turnaround, his encounter with God on, and with Jesus on the Damascus Road. I won't t read the whole story, but just a, a couple verses from it. In Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, we read, As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Here Saul had been persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem. He had bound many of them. He was present at the stoning of Stephen. He thought he was doing a good thing by killing Christians and by putting them in prison, trying to silence this, this cult, if you will. He's dead set against Jesus and his ministry, doing everything he can to stamp out this new faith. And now he's on his road to Damascus to stamp out Christianity there, to bring back those professing Christians who were Jews bound to Jerusalem to, to have them stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And suddenly this flash of light blinds him, literally, and he falls to the ground and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What a shock. Then we read in 5 and 6 of Acts chapter 9, and he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That must have been the shock of shock. Here he thought he was serving God. He was a Pharisee, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was an outstanding man within Hebrew culture. He was looked at one of the, as one of the most sincere and righteous men of their day. He was the rising star among the Pharisees and probably would have had a seat on the Sanhedrin if he had uh, kept with it. Can you imagine the shock when he finds out the very name that he's persecuting, Jesus, is the very God he's been saying he's been serving? What a turnaround. What grace that God would use this man to be his spokesman. And so in some sense, Jesus or Paul saw Jesus that day in, in the blinding light. But get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. So then Ananias comes and heals him after three days. Ananias doesn't want to because he knows Paul is trying to arrest Christians. He says, you're, you're, you're kidding God. You want me to go to him? No, I'm not going to go. And Jesus says, no, I want you to go because this is my chosen instrument to bring my message to the kings, to Israel and to the Gentiles, not just to the Gentiles, but to kings and to the Israelites, to the Hebrew people and to the Gentiles, to the whole world. And so in the, in the writings of Paul, we have the gospel of the resurrected Christ. We have the gospel of the new covenant, the gospel of grace and truth. 
So that's one encounter where, where I can think he perceived, he came to know who Jesus is and that he has this wonderful body prepared for him and to be present with the Lord when he is absent from the body. But also I think of later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, it says, boasting is necessary. He's arguing against these super apostles that were telling the church that he had planted that they would have to keep some part of the law or all of the law to live a really accurate and good and reliable Christian life. Boasting is necessary. So now he's boasting over and against these super apostles. Though it is not profitable, I'm not doing much good by doing this, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, who is he speaking of, this mysterious man? No, he's speaking of, his, of himself. And by speaking in third person, he's distancing himself a little bit from the pride of it. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I don't know, so he doesn't know whether he was translated into heaven physically or it was in a vision and spiritually. He doesn't know. God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. In Jewish culture, they understood there to be three heavens. There's the first heaven, which is the abode of the birds, the air, the atmosphere, where the birds fly and now we are, our planes fly. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the stars and the moon and the galaxies, the universe as we know it, that's the second heaven. And the third heaven is the highest heaven, is where God lives in another dimension outside of what we know as physical creation. And so he was caught up, whether in the body or not, he was caught up into this third heaven. Verses 3 and 4, And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows. Oh, did I miss it? Oh, was, yeah, it says it twice. Why is he saying it twice? To emphasize that he had really experienced this, that he had been brought into the very throne room of God, was caught up into paradise. Wow, what an enviable thing to be caught up into paradise. Garden of Eden was a paradise, but it was only a physical paradise. Paul got to see the real thing and heard inexpressible words, words that he couldn't convey to us, which a man is not permitted to speak. So he saw all this stuff and he can't even tell us about it. And I'm thinking, wow, do I want to know that stuff? I think back to those words that he's preparing for us, these light momentary afflictions are preparing preparing for us, achieving for us, an eternal weight of glory. There's no words to describe what's coming for us. So Paul, that knowing was born out of what Jesus had done. He is the apostle of grace. He is the apostle of the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, along with the apostle John. But he had seen such transformation in his life. His only ground to stand on was the grace of God. Paul is a dear, near and dear hero of mine. I've seen that same transforming power in my life. The grace of Jesus, which can take the most vile person as I, as I had become. And forgive me. And forgive you. And save us. And transforms our, our life in ways that I am wholly incapable of doing myself. My father was a man of rage. He was somewhat physically abusive, but he was really verbally abusive. We became the best of friends at the end of his life, and I've long since forgiven him. But as iniquity is passed on from the fathers to the third and fourth generation, he passed on his rage to me. And when I was first in the ministry here, when my daughters were just two and six years old, one of my daughters was out in the kitchen and I lost my temper and I yelled at her and she went running from the room in tears. And I was so ashamed. I went to the Lord and asked him, put this to death in me. I, I can't live this way. Confessed it to a group of people who prayed for me. And, his, and that rage just melted away. It's not that I don't get angry. I still get angry. Yeah, I can raise my voice. We all do. But no more rage. 
And so I think that knowing that Paul had of that incredible transformation and then being caught up into the third heaven, I haven't had any experience close to that. But he looked at the wake of God's work in his life and what he had seen in heaven and he knew because he had been in heaven, he had been in paradise, he knew that while we were at home in this physical body, we're absent from the Lord. We're not with the Lord. We're not in paradise. I think all of us can look back at the wake of our lives and, and we can see God's hand in our life. Those waves of grace, even bef long before we came to him, came to really know him, his grace was still coming over us, crashing over us, shaping our lives, protecting our lives. Oh, his wonderful grace. So he knows. He knows perfectly. He's a witness of what's to come. Those inexpressible things that he had heard and even seen in heaven. And what is it that he's knowing? That while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. There's a wonderful word play in this. And so I'm going to do, a, do something we're not supposed to do, but get into the original language of Greek. Because if I don't, you, you miss the word play. And it's this whole verse, these whole three verses are built on this word play. And it's beautiful. It's, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit has crafted his word through human beings. And this is crafted through Paul. These weren't just words for Paul. This was his experience. He had lived this. He had lived that transforming power. He had lived being caught up into paradise, into the third heaven. And so that word play is between the word at home and absent. At home in the body and absent from the Lord. And so what we see is, I'll bring it up here, at home is endemeo. And absent is ectomeo. You notice that in, in the English, they look like completely different words, at home and absence. But in the original language, this, the same, it's a compound word made up of two prepositions with demeo. And so you see that both, you can either read it in the transliterated version there in the middle, or on the right you have the Greek. And even though if you don't read Greek, you can tell that the only difference is the second letter. And so there's this word play between being at home and absent. And in, in that first preposition is in. So to be, it's literally, it's to be in home or at home. And the ek there, ek, is to be away from home. And sometimes it meant to be out of the country, that, that far away from home. And so we're not in our own country. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, but while we're on this earth, we are away from home. And so here's the, how that wordplay actually can be translated. When, when one is at home in the body, one is away from home with the Lord. Again, when one is at home in the body, one is away from home with the Lord. This is why Paul can take such good courage, knowing that while he's at home in the body, he's absent from the Lord, knowing that the opposite is true, which we'll get to. I think of this in my own case, and a lot of people in our church who are suffering from different maladies. A good friend of mine, Rocky, I won't give you his last name, but he was a pastor in the covenant. I just learned yesterday that he has pancreatic cancer. My heart just goes out to, to him and to his wife, Karen. What a difficult news to get. And yet as Christians, we take good courage in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. I can do all things. I can face all circumstances I find myself in. You can face all circumstances you find yourself in through Christ who strengthens you. That's the sense of those verses. When we're at home in the body, we're away from home with the Lord. And so I know that death then, I don't want to die. I don't know of anybody who wants to die. I don't want to be unclothed. It's a frightening thing to actually think about having your body die. And in my case, I'm going to be cremated. 
not looking forward to that too much. But this gives us a completely different understanding and a different view. To be at home in the body is to be absent from the Lord, which means we have this incredible future in front of us, this eternal weight of glory prepared for us, this unimaginable body that's been prepared for us, indestructible, immortal, imperishable. When one is at home in the body, one is away from home with the Lord. And then we move on and it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk. This is a Jewish idiom or a Hebrew idiom. Walking meant living. And the reason why they use that is everywhere they went, they walked. If they had to go to the market, they walked. If they went to the synagogue, they walked. If they were visiting their family, they walked. If they had to visit a neighboring village or town, they walked. Everywhere they walked or everywhere they went, they walked. And therefore, walking became synonymous with life. To, to live was to walk, and to walk was to live. Well, for us, it would be more, for we drive by faith, not by sight. I know that driving in Western Washington, you got to have a lot of faith. It's one of those things that I'm out on the freeway and people drive crazily. And I was extremely aggressive for many years. Last year, I prayed that God would Put to death my aggressive driving. I was an aggressive driver. Confession. And he did. He let, let me get caught by the police, who gave me tremendous grace by not arresting me or, or giving me a ticket. I'm so glad he, I learned well when God graces me. But when we're out on the, on the roads, especially driving to Seattle, people get crazy. I think Washingtonia is... Washingtonians are especially crazy. We were over in on vacation, I think in Colorado it was, and we were coming home. Maybe it was one of our other vacations. I don't remember which time, but we were coming home from Oregon, and we were coming across that bridge into Washington, headed for the Tri-Cities, and we just crossed the bridge. People had been so kind in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming and Colorado, wherever we had driven, I think even into Utah. We'd come up on a car in Idaho, passing a truck maybe, and I'd come up behind him doing the speed limit, and he would, that car would slow down, get behind the truck, let us pass, and then pull out again and proceed to pass. It's like, I've never seen that before in Washington State. It's everybody's pulls out in front of you so you, they can pass before you can get by. I get really frustrated in driving sometimes. Now I'm a man of peace because I put that as, the Lord put it aside from me. We we're coming across that bridge, not a car in sight ahead of me or behind me. And this woman comes screaming up from behind me, gets right up on my tail, switches over to the fast lane, goes right in front of me, switches back, and then slows down to 55. Not a car in sight. And I'm going, Arr! so we walk by faith. We have to trust other people. And so we live life from faith to faith. Just as we saw that we, we live life living in those ocean waves of God's grace, one ocean wave of his grace after another, we also live from one opportunity to trust God to another opportunity to trust God. For we walk by faith. And so we have that word faith. We have so over-spiritualized this, with this word. We turn it into something that it's not, if you will even the faith and faith movement. It's simply the word to trust. Faith, trust, belief, they're all the same word. We have different words in English, but it all comes from the same word in, in, the, in the original language of the New Testament. For we walk by faith. And so what is faith? I, I, I love illustrations, that, and I love this illustration. So here's what faith is. There's a, a suspension bridge. Likely in Nepal, you can see it looks like yaks fully loaded down with the Sherpas carrying very, very heavy packs. And you can tell that that's way up in the air, that the suspension bridge is suspended over a great cavern, or a great gorge, if you will. And it's holding their weight up pretty well. You're not going to see me crossing that suspension bridge. I'm deathly afraid of heights. It's getting 
worse as I grow older. I have benign positional vertigo, which means my aunt had it and she passed it on to me. I can't do heights anymore. When we were in Col Colorado, we were going to go up to Mesa Verde and I watched the video of the drive up there on YouTube and I literally fell into a panic, catatonic, I, I can't do heights anymore. I climbed one mountain, El Dorado. It looks very much that like that mountain, only has a much sharper uh, top on it and, and a peak. Last time I climbed mountains was with my brother. And never again. So here's, here's faith. We have two men. The Sherpas and the Yaks aren't there on the bridge. The first man is hiking in the woods. He's enjoying the beauty of the Himalayas. He's a man who doesn't have much faith, and he sees this bridge, and he, he thinks some of the boards look kind of rotten. It looks rather old. He doesn't know if it's going to bear his weight. But he, he wants to continue his hike, so he crawls out onto the bridge, catatonic like me, crawls out onto the bridge, and he gets out to the middle of the bridge, and it starts creaking, and he thinks, that's it. The bridge is going to fall through and I'm going to die. It starts swaying. And he says, what's happening? The bridge is going to collapse and I'm going to plunge to my death. And then he hears some loud noise coming from behind him. And he looks behind him and he sees a whole group of yaks and Sherpas coming behind him, fully loaded Sherp, uh, yaks and Sherpas with heavy packs on their shoulders. And so he understands this bridge is strong enough to hold them all up. And so he crosses, crawls the rest of the way across. I'm sure the Sherpas are thinking, oh man, right? That man had no faith, just a, enough faith to get out on the bridge. But faith is only as good as the object of what, of what we put our faith in. And what's the object of our faith? Jesus Christ, the one who can never lie, who gave a promise of eternal life with an oath, and he can never go back on an oath. And so our faith is only as good as the object of our faith. Faith in faith is, is no faith at all. We trust the reliability of Jesus himself and his strength and his power and his grace and his love and the peace that we he would give that he does give and that sure hope of everlasting life of eternal life the other man he comes up to the bridge he's one of the Sherpas he's there just enjoying a walk through the woods he's been over this bridge hundreds of times knows how sturdy it is but unbeknownst to him there has been a saboteur in in the area. I know this is a little bit far-fetched, but bear with me. The saboteur has cut the boards so that you can't see them, but they're now very, very weak. And he goes marching across the bridge, has great faith that this bridge is going to hold them up. And when he gets to that part that's been sabotaged, he breaks through and plunges to his death. And so you see that it's not the quality or the quantity of faith that matters. It's the object of our faith. It's the object of our trust. It's the object of our belief. Jesus says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, the smallest seed which can grow into a, an enormous tree, that's enough. Just this little bit of faith to say, save me, Jesus. I believe. So that's faith. Not faith in faith, not faith as a power, but faith in Jesus Christ, who has all power, all glory, all ability. The one who, through whom all things were created. The one in whom all things hold together. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So I look at, here's another suspension bridge, and I, and I go... I'm not going to go on that one either. It's a lot lower. It looks pretty sturdy, but it doesn't look as good as the other bridge. You know, we, we walk by sight in our cultures, especially in American culture. 
Seeing is believing. We, we have that saying, that idiom. Seeing is believing. But in the Christian life, believing is seeing. Believing opens our eyes up to whole new vistas. Believing opens our eyes up to the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and his grace. So Christianity is never seeing as believing. It is always believing as seeing. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Look at what Paul had experienced. He'd experienced an incredible turnaround in his life. Now he's proclaiming the gospel that he was trying to stamp out. And everywhere where he goes, he's persecuted for preaching that gospel. Both by the Hebrew people in the synagogues in the cities. They often try to stone him. Um, they tried to throw him off a cliff. He received from the Roman government the 39 lashes five times. Yet he does not walk by what he sees, even in his own body, or the fact that he's getting old, knowing that his, the day of his death is approaching. For we walk by faith. As I've said, one day this, is, this body is going to be in a box of ashes. It's just going to be ashes in a box. But being always of good courage. Being always of good courage. We walk by faith, by trust in, in the Lord Jesus, that he will raise us from the dead. And that to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. That's where we're going. I'm reminded of those words. What are the things that we can't see that we are to trust in? Well, we read for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all compar comparison. I can't see this eternal weight of glory in my life. I can see my, the transformation in my life. I can see the transformation in many of your lives that the Holy Spirit is, is bringing about as he continues to work in your life by his grace. But I have no way of being able to see this eternal weight of glory nor the body prepared for me. And in the next verse, verse 18 of 2 Corinthians, he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, our bodies slowly dying, the world slowly crumbling and groaning, but we look at the things which are not seen, the treasure in, in earthen vessels, the far surpassing glory, this eternal weight of glory that's going to be ours. These brand new bodies, which are sure as a building, a foundation and a building that is a permanent structure that will never be torn down, that will never be destroyed. No more death, no more mourning, no more tears, no more pain. And we'll spend eternity together in one body with our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit still filling us and worshiping the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All the things in my life that I've put so much importance in, books, I have this huge library downstairs. Once I got the diagnosis, I have, boy, did that seem foolish to have amassed all those books. Huge DVD library that I've my wife and I have collected, main, mainly me. These things are temporal. They're temporary. Is it wrong to have books and movies? No. But it puts things in perspective that all of these things are time-bound. Jesus says, don't put your treasure where rust and moths can destroy, but have your treasure in heaven. But the things which are not seen are eternal the treasure within, the eternal weight of glory, indestructible, imperishable, immortal bodies. I don't see those things, but by faith we walk 
by trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that these things are going to come about knowing. And again, I look back in the wake of my life. I see the wake of his grace. I know his power in my life. When I was 23, I suff suffered a severe head injury as a result of my drinking. I was an alcoholic. I knew I was an alcoholic. A friend of mine, Ron Tremaine at Vandy Camp's Dutch Bakery, had given me a little pamphlet, 20 questions. And I read those 20 questions asking about your life with alcohol. And it said at the top, answer these as honestly as you can. And, so I, and I answered all 20 questions, yes. And then I read at the bottom, if you've answered more than four of these, you are likely an alcoholic or you are an alcoholic. And it was like the veil was removed from my eyes and I saw who I was. But did I give it up? No, I resolved to, well, I'm an alcoholic. I might as well enjoy it. Well, I had this severe head injury after drinking. Gone out with my buddies after work. We had worked. We had been working at Vandy Camps all day, and after work we went out to the U District, a university bar and grill, and we had doubles. I think I had at least seven doubles. That's the last count I remember. The barmaid was having fun with us, mixing them very, very strong. And I would black out. I was a blackout drunk. I would a binge drinking blackout drunk. We went back to work. One of my friends forgot his coat at work. And I went into the bakery and I just went berserk, angry, angry at life, angry at everyone. Started swearing, turning over equipment, punching people. I ran outside and started running for the Mercer Street exit. Vandy Camps is built right on the exit that leads to I-5. And I started running towards the exit. And my friend Doug caught me by the hand and I pulled away and I started running down Valley Street towards Yale, right where Vandy Camps is situated. And I fell and hit my head against the curb. And I immediately threw up. My friends, instead of taking me to the hospital, which they should have done, but we were all too drunk, they took me home, threw me on my bed, and they slept the rest of the night on my floor because they were too drunk to drive. Next morning, I wake up and I have this enormous lump on my head, grapefruit-sized lump, softball-sized lump. And I thought, man, this isn't good. I took a shower and I went to call work because I knew I wasn't going to be able to work work that day. I wasn't feeling well. And when I got on the phone and talked to the receptionist, I went to say, I can't come in today, and no words would come out. I couldn't speak a single word. I'd lost my ability to speak. My friends saw what happened. They rushed me to the hospital, took me into the ER. As soon as the nurses, the intake nurse saw what was happening, they rushed me off to get a CAT scan. And then Dr. Lozier, the head of the neurology department, along with seven or eight interns came in. The interns were all saying, looking at the film, that they wanted to drill into my head to relieve the pressure because I'd let it bleed for, what, 14 to 16 hours. Dr. Lozier said, no, that, that won't work. It's all already co coagulated. Later on, I found out I had five bleeds in my brain, one in my speech center. Dr. Lozier looked at me and he says, Grant, I don't think you're going to live because you've let it bleed too long. You should have come in right when you had the head injury. But if you do live, you'll never speak again. I had seven days to lie in that hospital to think about my life. I destroyed every part of it by my own behavior. I couldn't blame my father's rage. I couldn't blame my mother's death. I couldn't blame my friends. I couldn't blame anybody but me. It was my fault. I destroyed my ability to speak. I lost my smell. I couldn't walk. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't go back to work. I lost my job. I was a student at the University of Washington. I couldn't go back to school. I couldn't pay all of my mounting rent and utilities in my apartment. And I couldn't pay all these mounting hospital bills I had. Literally, I had destroyed everything. On the third day, Dr. Lozier came in and he said, say the word bird. And I went, I knew how to say it, knew what it was, knew what it meant, but no pathway to get it out. It was just like having a stroke. Managed to get my father called and he called churches all over the nation. Over I surmise probably 10,000 people were praying for him, maybe 5,000. One of those people was Ann Nemel in our own church, who when she came and heard my story, she says, I was one of those praying for you. Hi, Ann, I hope you're with us today. Thank you for praying for me. On the seventh day, Dr. Lozier came in and said, 
say the word Methodist Episcopal. And I said, Methodist Episcopal. God had healed me. And Dr. Lozier was just blown away. He looked at me and he said, Grant, you are a very lucky man. No, I'm a very blessed man. End of the story is when I got diagnosed with stage four cancer a year ago in January, I have cancer in my right pubic bone, prostate cancer that had metastasized through my bloodstream to my pubic bone. I went to Seattle to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And as we drove up to the building, I realized that Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center is situated on the very location where Vandy Camps was built. And across the street, up, up the hill, just right across the street is Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And across the street towards the Mercer Street exit is that curb where I had my head injury. I hadn't been back in 36 years or 35 years. We weren't able to stop the first, the first visit, but the second time we visited, I parked on that curb and then just sat down on the curb and sobbed. And I didn't sob because I had cancer. I sobbed for the 35 years of sobriety that God had given me for a wonderful wife and two wonderful daughters, a wonderful new mom that God has given me. And this rich life that I have of being able to tell people of the powerful grace of Jesus, of his understanding surpassing peace, of the joy of the Lord that can bubble up in our lives, even in the hardest of times. He's always there. He's always been with me. He's never abandoned me. He's always with you. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. And so I look at the wake of my life and the grace in my life that had taken me from a horrible, horribly evil man to an earthen vessel who contains the treasure of the risen Christ, who contains the ministry of the Spirit, who's being transformed one, from one degree of glory to another into the very image of Christ. And this comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. And so I can take good care, courage, whatever happens in life. For we walk not by faith, not by sight. If I look at my life now, I could get depressed really quickly. These texts are good for my soul. I hope they're good for yours. We have such a life in store for us ahead. It goes on and it says, we are of good courage. Notice he says it twice, being always of good courage, we are of good courage. To be of good courage meant to be cheerful, to be confident. Why does he say it twice? In oral cultures, they said things twice. They repeated themselves to emphasize it, to say this is really important, that you and I can be of good courage because we know what the Lord has prepared for us. And what is he taking courage in again? We are good, good courage, I say, and prefer. That word prefer, it means to be well pleased, to think it good, emphasizing the freedom of, of intention. This is from the Complete Word Dictionary uh, by Spiro. I can't pronounce his last name, but emphasizing the freedom of intention to think what is good, meaning that Paul if he really had his druthers, if he really had his way, he would prefer, he would desire, he'd be pleased to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. So now here we have that wordplay again. He'd rather be absent from the body, meaning dead, and be at home with the Lord. Hmm, I'm not quite there yet. Again, we have the wordplay on absent and at home, only this time it's re uh, reversed. And so Paul would be saying, Paul desires to be away from the home of his body and to be at home with the Lord. So we have those words reversed. So if you put the whole thing together, at the beginning we, we had knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But I would rather prefer that to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. I, I'd, I'd rather be with home with the Lord. Some days I long to be with the Lord. But like with Paul in Philippians chapter 1, I don't know which to choose, whether to stay, which is better for all of you and for my family, or to go, which is more desirable. Now I've chosen to stay as long as I can, if that's even possible to make that choice. So putting this together, when one is at home in the body, one is away from home with the Lord. When one is at home in the body, 
one is away from home with the Lord. When one is away from home in the body, one is at home with the Lord. So death then is not this frightful thing for us who have entrusted our life to Christ, for those of us who have taken up the faith. The moment I die, I'm going to be at home with the Lord. The moment you die, if you've entrusted your life to Christ, if you have believed in who he is, that he is God, that he is the Messiah, that he came and took up your sin and died and that he was resurrected from the dead, then you will be home with the Lord at the moment, moment you take your last breath. In fact, it suggests in John that he will be the one who comes to take you to where he is that you may be with him always. So in the center of this, when one is at home in the body, one is away from home with the Lord. The center idea in this is for we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't look at my life with cancer. I don't look at my life with all the things that I'm struggling with physically. I don't look at your life. You don't have to look at your life with all the different maladies and the financial stress, maybe the loss of jobs, broken and shattered relationships, divorce, all those things that seem to trouble our lives and cloud our lives, this pandemic. We don't look at the pandemic, we look at Jesus. The more I look at the pandemic, the more an anxious I become, the more worried I get. The more I look at the circumstances around me, the more worried I get. But when I get my eyes set resolutely on Jesus Christ, then that understanding, surpassing peace invades my life. And I know this full well. I experience it all the, all the time now, this uncanny sense of peace that everything's going to be okay. For we walk by faith not by sight. Do you know what's in store for us? Do you have any idea what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has been able to even conceive? God has prepared for us. And that we put our trust. In that we put our trust. Amen. So again, thank you for joining me. I have a, a closing song and then a, a blessing. I hope this was enriching to you. It sure feeds my soul to be looking at these texts, especially in this season as we all fight this battle against the pandemic. And here's the song, Oh Praise Him. <laughs>
Oh, praise him. He is holy indeed. How rescuing this love, this love that has redeemed us. Thanks again for joining me. Let's close in prayer. Father, your love is like an ocean. Its depths can't be plumbed. Your word says how long and wide and high and deep is the love of Christ. We can never reach its ends. We can never plumb its depths. We can never reach its heights. What Paul is getting at in that prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 is that your love is immeasurable, boundless, and your love is free. You loved us even while we, we were yet sinners. Christ died for, the, for us, and in this is love. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for your grace, those waves of grace that come over our life. And Father, teach us to trust you, to have faith that we live from faith to faith, that we live by trusting you on this occasion into trusting you in the next circumstance. Thank you for today. Thank you for the richness of your word. And I pray that as people now return to their homes or those in Iraq return to uh, or turn in for the night, I pray what will retain in everyone's minds and hearts will be your word, your living word. Keep us safe this week. I pray that no one, none of us would come down with the virus, that you would preserve our life. And we pray for our world, Lord, that you would say, peace, be still. Peace, be still, and no storm, the storm of this pandemic, would come to an end. Yet, not as we will, but as you will, Lord. Well, that concludes our, our service again. Thank you so much for coming. We close with a, a blessing. From Romans 8, 35, 37 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord.